And um, on the the minutes for the last meeting, have we made any necessary amendments? I know I think Dan was actually on the meeting, uh, our first meeting, but I didn't see him on the on the notes. Otherwise, I make a motion to a, either approve or amend the meet, the minutes. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I didn't put that in the agenda to approve to um, approve minutes. So I'm glad you said that. Okay, so we'll add, we'll amend the minutes to reflect that Dan was here and contributed an immense deal of information. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. You're welcome. Julie, I know who my real friends are. <laughs> yeah, tuck that one away because you're right. <laughs> okay, no, that's great. So, um, okay, I had, uh, I'm, I'm going to apologize a little bit here. For those who don't know, I, I just, just landed on vacation. Uh, and all of the notes that I had for this, um, I, I, of course, can't find, but, um, so, yeah, I thought, for, you know, for this meeting, we would run through the, uh, uh the agenda as, uh, as Julia set up, we have some, some people who, uh, some guests, uh, who are, uh, going to present a few things uh, to us. Um, and we will, um, you know, I think, uh, talk about, um, the 1st steps in, in learning about what the town has already done in terms of uh, their work and efforts for um, uh, the people with disabilities in our town. So we're not duplicating efforts uh, or uh, trying something that perhaps didn't work previously. So for those who are involved in that community heavily right now, I thought uh, an Alder um, agreed that uh, we would learn a little bit about what's out there. So we will have some speakers throughout um, our meetings. So uh, as we have them going forward, um, and then, uh, also, um, you know, get some at, at the tail end of this meeting and new business talk about, uh, uh, some suggestions from the committee, uh, on where you think some of our, um, uh, initiatives, uh, should be, or where our focus should be. Uh, so the whole committee is kind of in on what we're planning, uh, going forward. Once we get uh, through this 1st meeting and, uh, other than the, the initial meeting, uh, and really start to talk about what we're going to tackle this year. So, um, I don't, I'll apologize. Um, Julia, I don't have the, um, the agenda in front of me. I haven't been able to pull it up, but I think, um, what was our 1st, uh, um, line item? Well, we should probably vote and improve those minutes, even though I left okay. that off the agenda. Okay. So, um, uh, I have a motion to approve. Okay. I Patty. Approve the minutes. Okay. And seconded. Alder, thanks. Second. Okay. Okay, so. Julie, is this a way to, to do intro so I kind of know who people are by happy chance or, or no? Just because I don't really know how to like this, how the uh, pizza puzzle comes Together and how each thing affects each other. So that might just just for me. I mean, it may not be important in general, but I'm just curious, just so I I know. And I think I was first in the list, but uh, I might be wrong. Okay, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, so do, before we get to the next one, we want to take a vote, Ron, on those minutes. So they're approved. And any more discussion? No, they were approved and seconded, or or motioned and and seconded. Um, Alder seconded. Uh, Patty. Made the motion, made the uh, motion to approve. All right, so we just need to have an all in favor. Oh, oh sorry, all in favor. Aye. Okay, I don't see any Aye. shaking heads now, so I think we're good. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so I think it's a great idea. Michael is our guest speaker today from the um, community partners program. So it would be great. I, I agree with with them to go around and introduce ourselves, especially um, Ron and Alder as chair and vice chair, so so he knows who's. In slash in the room, you know. Sure, sure, Michael. So I'm Ron Piccolo, um, the, the chair of of the uh, first year of the committee, um, Fairfield resident, um, uh, roughly six years. Um, I have a student in uh, in high school, uh, at um, Roger Ludlow High School uh, with disabilities, um, and. Um, yeah, just happy to be in the group here and, and uh, looking forward to getting this off the ground. Alder. 
Hey, uh, Mark uh, Alder Crocker, um, uh, C6 complete, so quadriplegic uh, in an electric wheelchair, uh, Fairfield resident. Uh, been here for about 17 or 18 years, and look forward to you know making some magic with this uh, with this committee. Patty. Hi, I'm Patty Donahue. I um, have a son who is a sophomore in high school. Um, uh, goes to Ward, and um, he's uh, got several different like physical and cognitive special needs and um, different types of di disabilities. So I um, I'm glad to be uh, here with all of you, and um, happy to happy to help. So. Okay, Dan. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Van Horn. I'm the senior pastor of Trinity Baptist Church here in Fairfield. Uh, I've got three kids in the public school, uh, but I'm here more as just a, a resident of the town and um, desire to contribute to caring for those uh, with special needs. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Karen. Hi, Karen Kaiser. Um, my son James is in his last year at the CPP program uh, with intellectual disabilities. Uh, De well, I was going to call Deborah, but she just uh, she got up and moved. Um, so, um, Mike, um, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. So, my name is uh, Mike Sensaro. I am actually the added district facilitator and. Um, Transition coordinator for Fairfield Public Schools. Um, almost 20 years in education in regards to uh, being a school counselor for a good portion of the, the upfront years and then in capacities of director of guidance and then 504 coordinator. And now the last four years I've been at Fairfield Public Schools and in, in those two capacities. So I'm excited to be here. I am uh, new in this particular role just this year, although kind of in some aspects, I did kind of do it last year under the previous person who was Crystal Brandy, if anybody knows him. Um, I know he's been in, in town and, and in the arena, if you will, for like 41 years. So, but I am his, uh, I am the new Crystal Brandy for lack of terms, but I, I keep on using that because people seem to know his name um, or the new improved either way. Um, but uh, I'm happy to be here and be part of this. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. I'm not too sure if there's questions or I'm not too sure, uh, um, Julie, exactly what information I should share or what, what you were looking for, but I'm absolutely happy to, to come out and, and any particular aspects of needs or the program or what have you, just maybe a little guidance and then more than happy to add some more insight. Ron, you want to take it from here? Sure. Perfect. Sure. Okay, well, um, you know, Mike, one of the um, things that, as I said in the beginning, we were trying to get an understanding of what is uh, offered in the community already. Um, uh, there was an interesting article that was distributed earlier today, uh, that I think it's very timely, in that um, it, it dealing with the, um, the younger adults who are transitioning, or, or actually not just younger adults, but all of the um, uh, people with disabilities within our community and what a what an great untapped workforce that is uh, and how underutilized it is in the state, um, even with uh, the commission that the governor has in place to um, to, to work on that and, and improve on getting these people employed and involved in the community. And that's one of the areas where we had uh, made uh, spent some time discussing in our, in our very first meeting is uh, how do we do better uh, partner with businesses, incorporate individuals uh, with disabilities um, into the workforce throughout the community. So seeing that the, uh, the CPP program is a program that transitions students into the workforce, um, you know, what are some of the efforts that, that you are undertaking there? What are some of the things that are available? What is the strategy there? Uh, just so we get a, an understanding of that, um, that piece of um, um, th that opportunity that's out there for for people, or the, in this case, the the, uh, 
younger adults transitioning. And, uh, and you're not allowed to go through this on mute. Unmute mute me. Yeah, I'm not, I'm usually used to Google. <laughs> so I have to run so many meetings, um, but I'm not used to the zoom here, but yes, I was muted, which. Uh, I apologize. So, yeah, I, thanks for the clarification. I definitely could address those two particular areas. So, you know, the unique thing is a lot of people don't seem to, you know, when it comes to particular pieces of ed education, if you're not, you know, immersed in it or, it, you know, a part of it, sometimes you, you're not aware of what's going on. So, or, or what's available and what are the different programs are. So, uh, two particular components. So, yeah, uh, as far as the, um, uh, out of district facilitators. So if we kind of take a look at, you know, special ed education from a couple different perspectives. So I work with all the students that are, are outplaced. That's one of the particular portions that I work with. I'm, I won't address that for a long period of time because I think the CPP is something that I, I think is going to be a benefit for us to discuss. So many students um, are, are placed in different programs, such as like Hope Academy, Cedarhurst, CES, and those are students that just need a, a more restrictive environment environment. So I administer those PPTs, work with them um, through the process. And um, where it comes to benefit of being a school counselor for 17 years, just making sure that those students are getting the credits that they need to ultimately get to a graduation point so they can also be a successful member of their community. Any student, and what's important to remember is that any student and especially with the new IP coming next year, needs to start thinking about transition. And that transition starts thinking about age 14. So as the students getting into their eighth, seventh, eighth grade year, the uh, school counselor, social worker, school psychologist, case managers are starting to talk to these students about transition. And when we're thinking about transition, we're really thinking about, you know, three components, but there's a lot of components under that. But basically you're thinking about independence, daily living, and post-secondary. So as you start thinking about those pieces, you're starting to help develop a plan through their IEP. So those students are starting to gain insight in terms of what transition might look for them. Transition, and that's a big word, and sometimes it's just confusing and it doesn't make sense. I like to call it pathways. So every particular individual who has an individualized education plan is going to have some form of a pathway. So that pathway could be going to college. That pathway could be um, military. That pathway could be a gap. Year that pathway could be a two year program at Norwalk Community College. How that looks and what that looks like is completely different based on the students' needs and what their disabilities are. The CPP or the Community Partnership Program is, an, is a program that I'm part of and I'm actually work directly in conjunction with Amanda Carrick, who unfortunately just can be here today. But the Community Partnership Program is typically designated, and we, and we start thinking about those students. Students as they start getting through their educational year, and we start thinking about that term pathways, um, we have students that need additional um, services, help, assistance when it comes to that independence, daily living, vocational, post-secondary. The community partnership is part of Fairfield Public Schools and addresses students that are, are in the 18 that they call 21 programming, but really goes to the day before their 22nd birthday. The community partnership is consists of three teachers. Each of them have a caseload of about six to eight students. We have a social worker. Um, we have um, a speech and language pathologist. You have me who's a transition coordinator, and then as and then you have eight to ten paras, and you have Amanda Carrick, who is the administrator that work. Her and I work in conjunction in the planning. So a typical day for a student, and I say typical because it, it, it really comes down to what the needs of the students are. So I'll talk about two different two different kids, if you will. That program is, is typically designated. It's really based on what the student's disability is. So we could have a student that is uh, uh, has autism, uh, intellectual disability. Uh, there's a variety of students that are in the program. We have 20 in the program currently. It usually is a, um, a plan that comes comes together with the family, with the student, and with their case manager in high school. And it's it's a building process to get to the point if it's the right program for the student based on what those needs are in those three particular areas of independence, daily living, and vocational post-secondary. So a typical day might look like for a student, they go 7.30 to 9.30. We work very hard um, on making sure that we have relationships with a local area gym. So they might go to the YMCA, they might go to uh, Edge Fitness. They start their day there. And then from 9.30 to 11.30, 
uh, we are to on a, a college campus. So we have been building relationships in the past with Fairfield University um, that has um, changed of, of recent this particular year. And we've been focusing more with Sacred Heart University and on the cusp of also working with University of Bridgeport. So the students are on campus. <clears throat> If you will, for those for two hours in a day, they're working on their IEP goals or working with their teachers. It might be getting speech services, OT. And then from 1130 to 2, those students are, are in an internship. Those internships are something that I'm directly responsible for that I have built and actually something I'm very proud of. So we have a lot of different internships. Um, we have companies that span from Norwalk to Bridgeport. Um, I'll just name a few. We have relationships with Walgreens, we have a relationship with Emrita, which is a manufacturing company in Bridgeport, very unique company, um, Arshad, uh, Bal is the owner there, amazing human being, and also has a, a son, a child who has special needs, so he really knows how to work with our students, and it's been an amazing relationship. Uh, we uh, uh, embarked a relationship with the Maritime Museum, so we have four to five students that are there, so they're really doing things from uh, working with, you know, the stingrays or working in the in, in the large uh, video complex theater where they're actually presenting to groups of people coming in and uh, talking about the different movies. So all their different departments. We also have smaller locations like the Beardsley Zoo, which is in Bridgeport, for depending on the student needs. Um, we have A&R Workshop in Fairfield, which is another one of our locations. So we have 20 active job sites, which I say that because because some school districts are even through COVID having great difficulty. Some of their kids still even this year weren't even going out to job sites. So having, you know, 20 different locations that, you know, that we're working with is something that is um, something that we're, we're, we really, really are, are happy with. Um, those students go out from 1130 to 2, as mentioned. And um, prior to that, they like said they're working two hours on those goals and objectives. They're trying to now implement those skills that they're learning in that independence, daily living, vocation, and there are um, lessons and projects based with their teacher to help those students become successful and it's goal driven. Um, they also have rubrics within their school day that they're trying to accomplish throughout that internship. And then through a stipend, we actually pay them for those hours. So that, that opportunity to be an internships is typically 100% unpaid. Um, it's really uh, no risk to the to the to the vendor, if you will. We provide our own certificate of insurance. We provide an agreement that we're going to have a job coach on site. So that's the, the eight to ten pairs that we discussed. Um, so we really try to make this, you know, a, an A to Z opportunity for students to go go to work, provide an opportunity for the student, but also for the uh, for the vendor where they really don't feel like as if this is like another person that they have to hire or that they have have to provide extra time and space, really go in with a goal and a mission. That job coach learns the job, and then it's that job coach's responsibility to really implement and teach those students the best we can. We're also, you know, right here in the senior center as well. Last year, we did have a little bit more, actually the year before COVID, we did have an opportunity to be, um, you know, in the coffee shop and have more of an implement just by nature of the delays and, and the timing of year. I think we're only there actually one day. Unfortunately, this year, we just didn't have enough staff um, and creativity to come together to, to get the amount of students that we've had in the past, but we're also in the senior center. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to offer that. Um, the, the biggest challenges and, you know, kind of things that I think um, that, you know, I want to, you guys to be aware of is one, trying to constantly have that creativity to come up with new job sites and have um, programs and companies interest in us, I have to say to you is very difficult because um, they're, if you're thinking about a small business, they're just thinking about, okay, how can I survive? I've got my three employees, you know, with, you know, taking on an intern, that's difficult. How am I going to do that? How am I going to train? That's more time I got to give. So that conversation sometimes can be difficult, but I call it sales 101. So if you talk to you know, 10 companies, you know, one or two are going to be interested, they'll bite at it, and then it's just, it's work. From the larger scale, from a spectrum, if you will, the larger companies, and I was excited, I just got Petco last week, but typically the the larger um, box shops typically also kind of push us away because, you know, there's usually a vice president of operations, a vice president to the operations vice president. There's just a lot of red tape to get to the point where you're trying to talk to the, to the right person. Uh, 
Um, but we do have a few, we have a few of those. That is, that is difficult though, to get in there. I would love to, you know, get into a Whole Foods or into a grocery store. Um, I just spoke to Mohegan Sun yesterday. They have probably the most exhilarating, exciting transition uh, job opportunities that I've ever heard of. But that's an hour and 15 minutes away from us. So how realistically um, can we get students there? I would say it's something I'm actually going to engage in because even if we transported this students there from 730 in the morning to nine, um, and then we say, hey, parents, you know, this is something you really want your kid to be in concert planning, because if you've ever gone to Mohegan Sun, they literally can be in any department. Um, so I was blown away that I could actually have a kid in the IT department in the lighting center, actually at, in a concert designing uh, and helping, uh, you know, the staff of Mohegan Sun develop a concert for Britney Spears coming in two months. You know, just the thought process of that, you can't get that anywhere. But it is an hour and 15 minutes away. You got transportation. How do we do that? Um, so that becomes difficult. So finding job sites, collaborating, you know, working with groups like yourself, networking, trying to figure out, okay, hey, this would be a really good job site for our students. Um, developing that is a challenge. The sustainability of the job site is important. So that's two. And then three, which honestly has been a really big challenge for us because we think it's essential to uh, to pay the students because they, you know, a lot of them are on social security and, and our Husky C plus many of the students are, you know, hoping to receive services from a DDS department of developmental services before they turn 22, get a case manager. So that, you know, that small check we, we provide plus the social security support is very important to many of these students. So we find it a benefit to give them a real check to, so that part of their banking, they can, and learn that aspects. Many of many of the students find that to be a challenge as well. Um, that has been a great challenge because we typically provide that payment typically out of a HUD grant that we get from the town of Fairfield, uh, but it's very limited. It's only three thousand dollars. So um, I'm already at the point where I'm actually going to spend through that. So trying to find you know again agencies, grants, departments, companies that are willing to. Um, participate and uh, and help out with that that third segment. That that's also a challenge as well. So to, you know to kind of globally you know for this, I, I'm not too sure exactly. Um, you know, if I'm talking too short or too long, I'm not too sure what information well, to share. Well, but the CBP is exciting. Um, you know, it's a very exciting program. I'm happy to be part of it. We're really enriching students' lives through that daily living independence and 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 a vocational experience with 20 amazing different jobs. Sites. And, you know, with that do come some unique challenges on a daily basis, but, you know, that's kind of CPP in a whole. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And, and you, 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 you jumped ahead of me on my follow up question when you got into the, the issue of how difficult it is to uh, find a, a vendor who will uh, support a program like this. So, um, is, in your opinion, is there anything that that could be done differently uh, incentives or um a different type of community approach perhaps to work with the these local companies that would um make them look a little more favorably on on the opportunity at hand you know that's a unique question i think partly the reason why so i'll i'll, I'll take i'll take two as an example so like the reason why amrita was so successful is that amrita has initially was the owner has a child who has special needs. So his heart already is driven towards seeing the benefit because many people don't. They say, all right, you know, that's going to be extra challenging. He saw the benefit because many of our students actually can do the job better than some people that, that don't have a special needs because he sees the uniqueness of, of that particular individual's ability to do that, that particular type of work. So his heart is already open to want to train the person. He also sees the need that, you know, this is an untapped um group of of the community that really need skills to be able to be successful in their future so that makes it easier you know right there and then he also has already hooked up with uh, a brs which is the bureau of rehabilitation services through their summer work experience um, that actually came by nature of a networking I would have never gotten in contact with Arshad Ball if it didn't by accident fall on my desk that he was looking for this internship opportunity. I called him up on a whim and it's actually become one of our most successful job sites. So the networking, the connection to understanding the need uh, for students and young adults to have an opportunity is key. And then the second one is the Maritime Museum. 
Um, and the reason why, again, that's been successful is that they understand that, again, that, you know, we're going through a pandemic. Many companies can't even find people to work. So their eyes, you know, have opened to this possibility, plus a few people on their staff. Um, you know, do have children that have special needs. So, you know, that again opens the door a little bit easier for them at the, at the higher level management level to see, wow, this is something that we really can take advantage of. And this is an opportunity for us to just put a little effort up front. And then we're going to have some really great interns that could lead to potential, um, you know, offers. The biggest and last challenge that I didn't get to, and I think it is your question is you know it's something that you know slightly keeps me up at nighttime is other than you know how do we pay these students from 18 to 22 i really want to try to find something for them past 22 because if when these students age out they are either going to be having direct access to dds but god forbid they don't fall under the parameters of dds then they are going to typically fall just under the platform of b arrest which means it's going to be you know low income um, you know, uh, priority through BRS to try to provide them a job. But those those individuals really need to have connection to the community so that they can be a viable member and, you know, provide, you know, help to their parents working at home, but also have some form of a career. That's that's another big, huge challenge that I, I don't really know how to solve because uh, there's just so few options for students post-22. Sorry if I gave you too much information to answer your question. I think there's a hand up there. Thank you. Uh, Mike, real, real quest, quick question. Um, you mentioned job coaches. Yes. Um, where do they come from? Are they within your program? Like you have staff, are they volunteers themselves? I got to unmute myself. So we have currently eight paras, which are also do dual rows of para and job coach. So in the morning time, if you will, when they're working with the students, up to 11 o'clock, they're, they're a para. They're helping with the individual needs, one-to-one -one needs of that particular student based on their IEP. When they go out to the job site from 11.30 to 2, those same paras are also their job coaches. Okay. Um, that in itself has been a thorn in the side because there's a national shortage in paras and in, in education itself in every department and, and from classrooms to CLC to the CPP. Um, there's a short, there's a shortage of paras. The paras are essential to making sure that uh, uh, things roll well. You do bring up a good point. I don't know if we've ever thought about volunteers um, in terms of assisting, but that's something that actually could be could be considered. But no, they typically are paid paras that work for federal public schools. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions uh, for Mike? Mike, it's Karen. I just wanted to go back when you started talking about some of the schools that you've worked with in the past. I know Fairfield was one that is no longer. Um, Sacred Heart, I believe you're still at. When did uh, University of Bridgeport come into the picture? University of Bridgeport has been an ongoing project. Am I muted? I'm um, Sorry. University of Bridgeport has been an ongoing project since October. So that is um, when things developed with with Fairfield University um, in regards to the difficulty of, of going onto the campus uh, from some of the different parameters that were in place. Uh, we I did start working with with Fairfield back in August 14th, and it just wasn't developing the way it uh, we thought it was going to. Um, I reached out to Sacred Heart University and got, you know, immediate job sites there and uh, access to their comments, their common area so that we could try to replicate the program that we had at Fairfield U because we weren't sure where that was going. Um, simultaneously, just by nature of my personality, because just kind of who I am, I always try to, you know, what's next? What's that? What can we do? And only taking no for an answer. Um, I also reached out to the University of Bridgeport. So um, through that, you know, October, November, reaching, contacting, figuring out, trying to figure out how we can have full immersion, that uh, that that's taken, you know, uh, up to this this point. There's actually there is a presentation that Rob Mancusi is presenting on tonight at the board in regards to that. I'm only really asking about uh, the University of Bridgeport because, as I'm sure you know, they recently were taken over. With, with Goodwin partnership, most of their classes are online. So I'm not sure how beneficial 
for any of the students within the CPP program, it would be to go there. It's an it's deserted. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. You talk about pathways and helping these students. Um, what would be the advantage at University of Bridgeport? I can't hear you. Sorry. It keeps on, it keeps on muting me on purpose. I don't know. I didn't realize that was a built-in feature. The aspect is the is the again when Fairfield University wasn't coming together. No, I didn't no, ask. no. I'm not talking about Fairfield. I understand that's off the table. What would be the benefit for these students the to go to the University of Bridgeport? Sure. The benefit is the full immersion of of the campus. We have full access to their athletic center. Their recreation centers. They're offering us up to 13 different uh, buildings from the College of Engineering to admissions to human resources departments. So the job sites are absolutely amazing of how many job sites the kids can actually go to. So if you think about a particular day, kids are going from edge to a to a place. Let's just, you know, it could be Sacred Heart, it could be UB, it could be WFC as we've known. So let's just say that space is anywhere. Um, and then from there, they they go out to a multiple different job sites. The 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 intriguingness and unbelievable aspect of you know in terms of being able to have a, a fully uh, executive suite on, on campus where we can have seven different offices. Students could be right there on campus, and and actually literally could walk over to their job sites um, is something that I think the program has always wanted. That's what Fairfield University had. Um, we do have that, you know, a 99% aspect at Sacred Heart University. We just don't have a designated space at Sacred Heart University because they're not renting to anybody because they increased, I think, I want to say 5,000 new freshmen on top of what they typically take. So I did reach out, you know, rigorously to try to rent space at Sacred Heart, but they weren't renting to anybody. Um, so we did, not, we did have some designated space, but there are other programs on campus that didn't have that same space that we had. Okay, um, but you're, you're going backwards to where you can't be. What I'm asking you about University of Bridgeport is it's a ghost town. How is that going to benefit these students that need immersion and to be with other people in the workforce? There is nobody there. And I've been there, walk I've been there where, they go, where they do in, in the town of Fairfield now to other places. They can't walk anywhere where the school is situated there. There's nothing there. I, I think I addressed the question. So they're, they're there throughout the day if they want to be. And they have full immersion to all those different departments from the library to the bowling alley for recreational activities to their different student centers. Uh, to the different buildings, they can have passes to the lunch. There are on campus. I've been there, I, you know, throughout the day, there's there's 3,500 students there. So I'm not too sure if it, it's a ghost town. I'm not aware of how many students students are online versus on campus. I have been there. There are students on campus. So again, I'll just go back to the, the full immersion of being for them to be there, have access to 13 different job sites so that they don't have to be bus to 13 different locations is something that's quite appealing. All right. Well, for the record, I know that you are recording it. I do not think that that is a full immersion program for these students. They Sacred Hearts does not recruit over 500,000 students for their incoming freshman class. They're not that large. Sure. Um, but they did tell me that it's not that difficult to find out the difference for uh, their in person classes versus online, which I can find out easily. Sure. Karen. Can I just jump in one sec if I can? Um, so this Mike is here to just give us an overview of the program, and I, I just don't want to get too too far down the rabbit hole of this one because our okay. role isn't to advise on educational programs. It's good we're just trying to get the information and also to hear about what's going on. So if if um, Rob is doing a presentation to Board of Ed, that might be a great spot, Karen, for you to to go to attend that meeting and make your comments known there. Our role is much more advisory for what happens when these kids, you know, graduate from the program and how we can help them in the community. So I get what you're saying. I just, I just want to be clear about what our role is as, yeah, as this. I appreciate it. Okay. Unfortunately, I cannot attend. I have a work event myself tonight. So. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Julie, I did want to say, and Karen, and I, I do say this to you. I think I've had some conversations in, in, in the past with you. If you, if you know somebody I've contacted, I think. 10 different deans at Sacred Heart University. I, I, I might be off 
on the number. When I was there, they told me they, uh, and I can't think of the dean off the top of my head, who was in charge of facility. He told me that they increased the freshman population. I thought she gave me the number of 5,000 increasing to what they typically take in, that they did not have any additional space. They were buckling at the seams, that they were not renting to anybody. If you know somebody that I can speak to in regards to rental space, having a dedicated workspace, I would love to have an email from you in collaboration that I need to, you know, you need to speak to, you know, Dean Mark, you know, whoever, who that right person is, I, I would call them tomorrow. But I haven't been able to get anywhere and, and leasing space, guaranteed space. I'm happy that uh, Lisa Gallagher from, um, you know, dining facilities has opened us to JP Dining, to the Cafe 63, to the Abbey Cafe. The job sites at Sacred Heart University are absolutely breathtaking. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to compare Sacred Heart University to Fairfield, but I can say without a shadow of a doubt, I am super impressed with SHU. Uh, um, and would, would love to have a dedicated space. We had one in September, but because uh, of other programming, um, you know, saw that we were using a back room, if you will, well, that it, it kind of dispersed. So uh, we're happy that we're there and we're using common space. But if, if you have somebody that uh, can help us build a program, get access to the more um, so, guaranteed okay. facilities, <laughs> definitely. Thank I you. can't help you at Sacred Heart, but I possibly can help you at Fairfield Geo. That's where I'm sitting right now. So if you want to share, you know, share your contacts for and he, who you were trying to work with at Fairfield, I can try and help. Yeah, I, I would suggest if we could, if we could take that offline, perhaps because I know this is a very hot topic right now. But as Julie said, we we have to focus on a, a lot of different things that that don't include the board board of education, and that's really a whole separate. Um, department, it's not in our area of responsibility. It's great to have the topic and talk about. Um, what's what the availability is, what the changes are. Um, the transition program for getting our, our uh, young adults and adults into the working force. And I understand the passion behind the. The presentation that's going to come up tonight, but, um. Uh, let's let's try to stay focused here on. On what we can contribute to and, um, and what we have on our agenda. I, I hate that. I don't need to cut you off. Uh, overall, Karen, I, I appreciate all your comments. No, not at all. I appreciate it. Mike, you can reach out to me offline and I'm going to say bye guys. Have a good okay. day. Thank you. And Mike, thanks for, uh, for your input and walking us through, uh, what you do. I think the, the tail end of it was, was really insightful in terms of. The difficulties uh, that may be faced in in finding those partners in the community. So we appreciate it. Yes, and understand as again, unfortunately, I don't know anybody who's online. I know Julie. I am not a decision maker for Fifth Public Schools as a transition right. coordinator. I'm trying to develop relationships. Um, you know, if if, if one relationship is going bad, I'm looking to the left and right and trying to build a relationship here. If one company isn't working out well, I'm trying to build three other companies. So then that comes together with programming with, you know, the other individuals that I mentioned. And, you know, if, if, if one hole gets buried, you know, I'm digging another one. Um, you know, I, I just, I'm here because Julie invited me. Yep. Um, if it was a part of decision maker, that definitely should have been Amanda and Rob. I'm, I'm just here to present on the CPP and what I do the best that I possibly can, but I have nothing to do with decisions. And, and we appreciate your time and, and, uh, and for joining us. For joining does anybody else have a uh, any other follow up question on the transition or or workforce workforce for uh, for Mike? If not, we can move on to our next uh, agenda item. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Talk to you soon. If you want to ditch us, feel free. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. I hope I hope hope I did. But you wanted me, Julie. I'm so happy to be working with you. And, and thanks so much for your access to the senior center. I appreciate it so much. Sorry, sorry. Have a great day. Take care. <clears throat> okay, so for the committee, um, uh, Julie sent to me a little while back, and then I, I uh, distributed to everyone a, um, a study that was done by uh, Sacred Heart uh, University graduate students, um, uh, where they evaluated throughout several towns within the state of Connecticut that had. Uh, commissions on disability, the types of things that that those towns do and those committees do. Um, 
uh, I hope uh, based on the feedback, I think everyone had a, had a chance to to read through that. Um, uh, we had a follow up conversation with um, uh, with uh, Sacred Heart, and uh, and they're going to uh, be doing an, a second uh, a study for us, uh, a report for us uh, this year, uh, looking at along the same uh, lines guidelines uh, opportunities for partnering with local businesses more inclusion and acceptance um, of people with disabilities throughout the community. How do we get um, people with disabilities out of their, their comfort zone in their homes and out into the community, whether it be in the arts or working or just in activities um, and uh, making sure that they're more, more visible, more uh, a part of our community uh, and more accepted. Um, I think there's uh, Julie said that it's going to be a, a separate study, but on uh, on the side of the aging, there's also going to be a um, a walking survey of the town. So I think that you know we're coming at it from different directions. I think we'll um, we're going to come up with some really uh, insightful insightful work here from two different departments. But uh, we walk through with the um, uh, the graduate students. Um, the types of things that we were looking for, you know, more in depth uh, information on um, on what other towns are doing, what, what they're accomplishing, um, how to document and communicate uh, out to the town, uh, because uh, the, the younger generation is very comfortable with uh, social media. Um, <clears throat> I have a little bit of a a feeling like it's a build it and they will come mentality and. We have to do something to get people to go to that website to see the the information that we have. But uh, I think that uh, from what came out of the the previous work from Sacred Heart, um, communication, communities understanding of what's available, uh, what what the first responders, police, and fire do to prepare themselves uh, and be trained for those people in the community, uh, the, those types of efforts are are often unknown. To the community at large, so uh, how do we get that that word out there? I don't know if Alder or Julie, if you want to add anything additionally to uh, the conversations or um, or the work that they're going to be doing. Alder, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? I apologize. I mute and unmute on two things. Um, just that um, Brenda Kupchik's got a weekly email that we can access also. That she's got about 26 or 27,000 uh, uh, people that she distributes to. So as we move forward, even when we're, you know, with regards to how the uh, the report comes back and how to publicize and promote what it is that we're, we're, we're working on and the availabilities, then we can use that as something as a, as a way to get to people maybe before we hit social media. So, I mean, that's, I get that every week and I look forward to it and I read the whole thing top to bottom. So that's it. Otherwise, thank you to great job, Ron. If I may, Ron, I just would like to add that one of the benefits of having the students do these projects and this research for us and, and to work as a committee, I mean, as a commission to come up with ideas of areas that we want to focus on is that it gives us, you know, kind of a um, outline of what we want to do and what, you know, the, the commission will hopefully be more than, um, you know, a listening group. So to be able to identify areas that we can um, target and tackle and have different interests doing that. I think, I think it's going to be very exciting. Yes, I think that if I remember correctly, demographics was one of the things that uh, we were hoping uh, we could get out of this study, just understanding um, who's out there and who needs what. So uh, we can help focus our, um, or direct our focus on in the areas that will best serve the community. So uh, really looking forward to their work. They, they seem extremely excited and motivated to do this. Um, it's, uh, it was right. It was a great, uh, great conversation to have with them and, and see their enthusiasm for it. Does anybody have any, any questions about, uh, that up upcoming project? 
No. When you yeah. say demographics, um, like I was just looking at some of the the like the survey monkey that was done, and I know it wasn't like a complete study or anything like that. But when you when you mentioned demographics, would there be more of a breakdown in terms of ages of individuals with disabilities or uh, like the family makeup? Um, I I did notice like in in the survey response, at least with the survey monkey, it was kind of skewed more towards older individuals. Um, I'm just kind of, I just completely anecdotally, I just get a sense that there's more of a need out there with younger families that may be less inclined to respond to a survey because they're like in the midst of, of the business of life. So is that something that, that we would at least be able to like maybe request or maybe they're already attentive to that? Yes, they are. And we're going to try, um, there when they come up with their, with their questions, they're going to forward them to us oh, okay. and we'll review them. And, um, and if we see there's an area or, or a way to, you know, rephrase it or, or put it in a way that we're getting more of a, um, uh, an answer that's, that's uh, tangible, uh, rather than a, you know, a, a free form, uh, question that we really can't throw into, a, an average of, of some sort, um, then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try to do that, uh, for sure. It may be difficult. I think, you know, they use some, uh, this, the previous sacred heart, um, study used, uh, some of the state information and that that seemed to mirror our town a little bit you know uh, heavily weighted to 65 or you know 55 plus um which then you know leads you to is social media the right thing to do but as alder said we've got the the um the uh, email newsletter blast that goes out so uh, i think it will help us understand who our uh who our target uh, market is and, and how we can then go out and reach them but yeah i think more granularity on that would be you know very important to have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, uh, oh, I see a hand up. Deborah. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. I can. I I'm a Fairfield citizen, uh, and I'm disabled, and um, I'm. Acquired a disability in my life. I was not born with one and I just, um, want to emphasize, I guess that not everyone is. You know, born with a disability and, um, there are people who acquire them at all ages and, um. Uh, whether at birth or, um, later and uh, the granularity of what you're talking about really um, is a life, you know, span, uh, can be a lifespan, and that it can also, um, I think maybe one way to think about uh, this whole issue about Fairfield citizens with, and I'm not sure how to say this, disabilities, or just really like the um, name of this um, commission, I'm not sure who came up with that, but, um, that is that, um, and excuse me, I'm very tired and I happen to have a cognitive dis disability. Um, one of the things to think about here is that, uh, and to ed help maybe educate the community at large is to realize that what we're trying to do is have empathy for our future selves because the likelihood and the, um, possibility that any, any person in this town could become disabled is very high and only increases with age. So I would just um, like to put that on the table that what we're trying to do is is have empathy for our future selves. Now, in our my case, it's already there, but in many people's cases who are uh, non-disabled people, um, you know, that's all, um, I mean, that's, that's all in the large picture. I think what, um, I, as a disabled person would like to see, and I think that in that framed in that way, um, it's not, this is not really a matter of shining visibility on me, but shining visibility on everybody. Very well said. Thank you. And that is, um, I, I, I think in, in this. With this, with the subject of this call, 
that may have not come through as much as we do understand that. I think that the committee is, uh, is very aware and I think Alder is going to make sure that we're uh, keenly aware of that. So, um, I, I think we have yeah. uh, both sides of the spectrum there. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not accusing any, oh, no. I'm no, new no. to this. This is my, my first meeting with you all. So I'm not saying that it's just, you know, no. I, um, I just the, a lot of the conversation so far today just probably is by chance skewing young and skewing towards the um, what sounds like pe you know families with younger kids and and kids who have been born with with um, um, disabilities. So you know that that's my only comment is that. Um, We are Thank all you. we are all on the verge of you know a p potentially on the verge of being um, disabled. Thank you, Deborah. I uh, I was disabled. Um, I had an accident three and a half, almost four years ago. I'm 58, almost 59, so I'm in that boat. Totally understand. Will be represented. Thanks, Alder. Thanks, Deb. Okay. Um, the final piece of, of new business we have uh, an open discussion for uh, the commission on um, on initiatives um, uh, to get your thoughts on um, areas of focus for us, either short or long term. Um, so I'd like to open it uh, open it up to the floor uh, for those who would, who'd want to weigh in and. Um, and we'll we'll document all of the uh, all of the ideas and asks, and then uh, we'll we'll put together a priority list and and um, start to shape our future. Great. Does anyone want to start us off? I'll start here. I'll just uh, maybe just jump in and just share 1, 1 thought that I had. Um, I did notice just in kind of uh, reading some of the material, but then just thinking about it in general. Um, that in thinking about the, the, the makeup of individuals that we're thinking of, there's kind of a 2nd tier individual. I, I'd like us maybe to just keep in mind and make, maybe it doesn't need to be a priority, but. Um, just the idea of respite care for caregivers um, and, and is that something that the town provides or or makes available or you know um, because I think it does have an impact not just on the individual themselves but on their either their family or their community um, because you know these are the these are the people who are walking alongside these individuals and I don't know that was just a uh, thought maybe that could be a some information we're able to glean more about as we as we un uncover things. I can tell you that the town does not provide respite care. What we typically do for in in the senior realm is refer to agencies that do. But I think there's, you know, there's the Family Leave Act and there's other things coming up now that I think it's a great point, Dan, is to try to find those resources and have them all compiled so that when when somebody is in need and cannot see through to the end of it, they that we that we can give them those resources. I think that's a great idea. I yes. think it could be helpful to start to brainstorm on scope that we want to cover for our um, focus areas. There's a tremendous amount of of great ideas via this 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 group of folks. The articles that have been shared about whether it's um, Building awareness, building more community, focusing on accessibility, focusing on uh, readiness for for jobs, engaging the um, local um, local organizations. So I think in order for us to to feel like we are going to make some progress, we may want to start to start to ideate around you know what's our mission for this first year, and and then start to develop ideas around that focus areas, just 
is just a thought. So for, you know, I, I came into this committee very much focused with a lens because I have a young child um, and hearing all of you and all of our passion around this. I think we represent a lot of different communities um, that are impacted by this. So I just thought, you know, as we start to talk more and um, discuss, it may be helpful to, to, to start thinking about, you know, what, what do we want to try to accomplish in this first year so that we feel like we are using our time and resource in the most valuable way. Yeah, exactly. I think, um, I think we need, to, we, we need to limit the number, number of initiatives that we take on and, and, um, you know, Julie and I have spoken and, and Alder about things like, do we address, you know, if you look at the survey, some, and, and some, and the, the other sacred heart study, uh, transportation, housing, advocacy, you know, these were a lot of the hot topics or, you know, the top three or four that would come up on all of the responses. And I just, I don't, you know, I don't know that, that we, we can be effective in those areas. So, so what are the things that we can do as a community engagement? Is it empathy? Is it, you know, what are the things that we, we can say, all right, these are the three things we're going to tackle this year. And we know we can, if we're not going to get to get to the, the goal line. Maybe we can drive to the, you know, into into the 30 or the, to the 20 yard line and, and get ready for next year to really make a difference. Um, but, uh, you know, where can we make the biggest impact? Uh, so, yeah, I agree. I think we, we need to stay focused. I mean, 1 of the things, for example, that's very top of mind for me is accessibility. You know, when I'm with my daughter who uses a wheelchair and I'm downtown, there are stores we can't still even get into because of the infrastructure. I look at the playgrounds around Fairfield and, um, you know, I requested an adaptive swing for the 1 that's right near my house and to the credit of parks and recs, they, they did it, but that's still the only accessible thing that she can do. I'd love to see more um, accessibility. So that it's, so again, just speaking for me personally, but um, so that's one thing that, you know, I'd love to see some, some thought behind, but I also think the topics raised today around, you know, um, uh, being an HR, I, I run um, a, a segment of the HR function in the company that I uh, work for. So hiring and diversity and inclusion is also very important in terms of representation. So, you know, partnering with local organizations around how to make sure we're providing equal access to jobs and opportunities to um, everyone in the community, I think is also another important thing. But these are very, you know, broad and meaty topic. So I know that again, to your point, we can't, we probably have to be very thoughtful on, on what we can focus on and, and try to go, go big with it if we can. <laughs> yep. Yep. Super. Anybody else, Patty, any, uh, any thoughts? I mean, no, other than the things that came to my mind are the ones that are really difficult to approach like housing and more programming, quite frankly, for all age groups. Um, I, I've been um, on SEPTA's board since my son was three and he's 16. And um, I've been on the board all, all, the, all those years and done programming many, many years. And, and um, it's tough. It's, it's just so difficult to get facilities. It's difficult to get, um, people on board i mean it 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 goes hand in hand with the with the respite care uh, you know there's parents want their kids to be able to do this but they they can't affordability you know so there's just there's so, there's so many things there's so many things but um i think we're headed in the right direction with with some of the things that we've come up with but personally i'd like to see more more programming and i think parks and recs is doing better i, I really do i think we we are offering more things, but I just, I just really wish there was more for all age groups, not just adults, not just littles, but yeah. everyone. Yeah. Okay. Does, does it make sense? Um, so there's a practice and maybe Adrian, maybe you uh, would be familiar with this in the HR world, but um, where there's these like value cards where you have like a deck of cards, they've got a value printed on each one. And you start by kind of you, you put them all out and then you, you select 10 and you just kind of filter it down until at the end you kind of have this prioritization of like your top value, your second top value, your third. I, I just wonder if it makes sense for us to kind of 
either whiteboard a number of these ideas and, and not even prioritizing them yet, but but put them on the board, and then you know in in congruence with the the study that's going to be done, with whatever information we have, maybe maybe reaching out to certain um, maybe it's reaching out to the um, a couple of different organizations within town that can kind of give us some input on. Uh, on value, like how they might value some of these things. And then begin to build some priorities around it. Housing, I know was 1, um. From the, the, the survey, and I think it was also echoed in the, the sacred heart study as well, but. Um, because I mean, there may be a lot of really important things that we need to address and we can over time, but maybe. Once we look at them all. And, you know, 1, 1 whiteboard or 1 screen or whatever, we can begin to say, what are the, maybe there's like 1 low hanging fruit that we can go after now. And just kind of give some encouragement to the community to say, see, we can make a difference. And then, you know, maybe pick another priority that we want to. Um, pursue without scrapping the rest of them, but just saying, here's what we're going to focus on. Ron, to your point in this 1st year or whatever. Yeah, short, short and long term, you pl planting the seed on the long term yeah. uh, goals. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree that you know, uh, make, making an impact immediately so the town can see it. And down the road, really, it comes down to the, does the town want, want to, you know, we're going to have to, everyone's going to have to partner in on this because there's going to be multiple departments making this type of thing happen. If, if Fairfield wants to have a world class um, program of inclusion or, if they, if we want to, you know, get better. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when we understand, you know, things like funding and, uh, we start to hear what the dialogue is as we raise points, then, um, you know, we'll see, but I think, I think Brenda's behind this tremendously, um, from everything that, uh, that I've heard. So I think we've got a real opportunity here to, um, um, you know, hit hit uh, to use the base. I don't even like baseball, but I'll use the baseball analogy again. Hit some singles and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, tee up a home run. So we'll see. Um, I love baseball, and it shows you don't like. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a great idea. It's something we could do um, that we had talked about. Um, Alder did send a note that he had to hop off for a call. Was was maybe doing a proclamation for the anniversary of the ADA. And, you know, I know that um, the 1st select woman was excited when this uh, commission was formed and, and, you know, maybe it's, it's um, an opportunity um, and Tom, if you could chime in too, maybe we could have a, a proclamation and have the commission there to receive the proclamation from the 1st select woman. And then in this, in the sacred heart university students also said they would work with us on an ongoing basis if there were events and, and things that we needed their assistance with or projects that we wanted to do. So, you know, it'd be great to, and that's July. So end of July would be ADA. It might, you know, that's, it's something we have time to do, to, to do publicity with, and we've never had access to communication like we do with this um, townwide update. You know, the last survey went out on our emails into agencies. This is huge for us. Um, it, Tom, do you think that's something that, that is doable? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Something? Uh, yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to sound like a, 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 a Brenda Booster, but yeah, she's very much supporting. She's very much involved. She wants this to be, uh, you know, to do as much as we can do in this kind of format. And I was thinking as I was listening, you know, I wonder, and, and before I get to my thought, uh, yes, we can use her newsletter. Yes, we can put it in. I help write most of those, so uh, I'm sure we can squeeze paragraphs or a survey in or anything like that, or at least provide links to a survey, that sort of thing. So I think I, I think that's easily doable and something she would be very supportive of. But the thought I had as I was just listening is, we're talking about this this program, or maybe we should do this, or maybe we should do that, and and as I. And, and maybe it's my fault and maybe it's something uh, that I should be more aware of, but if somebody, I would be very hard pressed if someone said, well, can you list all the programs that we currently do for disabled people, for seniors, for what, what exactly are the programs that the town is involved with and in putting out? I don't, I, I don't know all of them. 
Uh, I don't know all those programs, and I think it might be it might be beneficial for us to really get a sense of what are the programs that are currently being provided to the public. And I think if we make those public, for lack of a better word, I think people would be amazed at what we are currently doing, and many people wouldn't even know that some of these programs exist and that they can take advantage of. And I don't mean to say it in terms of, and we don't need to do any more. I think that may be a good starting point where we can start developing ideas to say, okay, well, right now we're doing this and the other thing for the seniors. Maybe we should do more for disabled. Or maybe we have these things for these kinds of people. We need to do more in this scenario, that sort of thing. And it might give us a framework, and I'm just spitballing, but it might give us a framework to say, okay, we're really deficient in this area. We need to focus on providing programs to do X, Y, Z, whatever that is, I have no idea, but, and, and at least give us something that we can start to follow up what you were saying earlier, to follow up, okay, what's the goal? Where, what are we trying to accomplish in the first year, second year, third year? We started out with eight programs. Maybe in two or three years, we have 15 programs where we're serving not 1,000 people in town, but now it's 3,000 or 4,000 people. I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing ideas out, but I'm thinking, since I don't know all the programs and I live here every day, I'm sure a lot of people out there probably don't know all the programs that they would be A, entitled to, or B, can take advantage of. And, and you know, I'm, I'm putting off to the side, I, I know parents are very involved with their children and finding out what they can do for their children, but I, I just think that there's probably a wider universe out there that's underserved, if you will, uh, probably because Either they don't know about it or we've done a lousy job of of uh, advertising or promoting, that sort of thing. But these are just some thoughts I had while I was listening to the earlier conversation. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It, it, is, it is the first step is to understand what's out there first um, and, uh, and, and communicate it out to the, the community. Um, it, several of us had no idea that the police were uh, were trained to deal with people with disabilities in different ways. They have, they have a task force that does that. Um, that's, 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 some, you know, I'm sure the, the, the fire department, if they don't see, if they don't have one could develop some sort of first responder list of understanding where these people live. And if they have to go be a first responder, what are they, what, who's going to be there when they show up uh, and understanding all of that. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure these things are, are either if they're not completed already, they're probably in the works. So understanding that is uh, is key. But but that'd be something that I'd want to follow up on and make sure that in fact they are doing it. I mean, one of the things that one of the things quick things that come to mind is we all see AMR is always around. AMR, the rescue, you know, American whatever it is, AMR. And why is AMR here? Maybe we should have other people here. Are they fully trained? Are they, you know, I don't know the answers to the questions, but I think the answers may all be, oh, yeah, 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 everything's all set. But I would think that's something that this commission should know and kind of be involved with. To look for a better word, I don't know, but to be involved and to make sure that people are certified, they know what they're doing and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, I just think, I just think that would be very beneficial to the town as a whole. I do know that some communities have a voluntary list that um, police and fire have, and I and I know our both our police and fire departments are are great about um, training. But it would be you know something that that we had talked about was having um, somebody attend and speak to that you know police and fire, and um, I had sent out a note saying that Parks and Rec will be next month, which is or yeah our next meeting, which is May. Because they're working on their master plan, but those are, I mean, these are all really great areas. Um, well, you see, that's a very good point you're bringing up because park and rec right now we've spent a lot. We're spending a lot of money to develop a master plan and that's for the use of all park and recreation facilities throughout the town. And this is going to be a multi year program. This is going to be, I, I suspect a real blueprint for how park and rec moves forward. I would want to make sure that. Somewhere in this plan, um, you know, disabilities are taken care of, are considered, are part of that plan. Because if it's not, 
it's going to be really hard to get it into the plan. I don't know if this makes sense, but once the plan is presented and everybody says this is great and all that, they say, well, we really didn't consider disabilities that much or at all, then that provides a whole other problem because now we got to kind of shoehorn into a plan and I don't want to see that happen. Uh, I'd rather do it up front. Um, so I'm going to lean on you, uh, Julie. I hate to do this to you, but make sure Anthony's telling his outside people that we want this to be part of that plan. Whatever that is, I don't know, but mm -hmm. I, they they need to be cognizant of these kind of issues uh, to developing the plan. And if the answer comes back, yeah, they're already doing that, great. But let's just make sure. That that's I totally okay. agree. Totally, and they they will be coming in May. But and I, th I think on the link I sent out was the the website that anybody can add ideas to that master plan. So you should all have that. But um, we, you know, Ron, I'll include that again in um this month's minute. You know, the minutes. Okay. Okay. And I'm sorry, we're talking a little shop here uh, to have Julie do something with Anthony to make sure it happens. So, okay. it. thanks for that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Julie, did you have a uh, department update? Um, I don't have much. Yeah, I, thank you, Ron. Yeah, I have. I don't have much of a department update, but I do have a couple of things that I wanted to mention. One was that Parks and Rec master plan. Um, the other was. Um, there's a restaurant bill that's going before um, the state reps in the state house about um, expanding the um, outdoor dining. And I, I sent to you, Ron, and to Alder a quick thing. They were looking for um, some comments about that, but I will send out through the minutes to you and through Ron. So I'll send it to Ron, and then you 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 know send it to the group about if you wanted to make comments on the. Um, public plan for outdoor dining and outdoor markets, you know, part of the testimony is about cutouts and, and accessible parking and making sure that pathways aren't blocked. It's a good opportunity for, for us to, to comment on that. That was one. The other was um, the townwide master plan, I mean, the parks and rec plan. I think that was, those were the two big things, but if there's a third one, oh, the third one was the community resource directory that I included in the, um, and uh, the meeting announcement, that's a couple of years old. So at some point it would be great to um, take a look through that update resources that are still there or not there. And that might be a place that we can start looking at, um, as Tom mentioned, what events and programs and activities are already out there. You know, there's no mention in that about the um, wheelchairs for the beach because those are new and we haven't updated the um, that community resource directory in, in quite some time, probably three or four years. Uh, I think that was it for me. Okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I hesitate to ask for any other business because I don't think we have a quorum anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, that's, a, well, that's all right. That's all right. So, uh, um, we'll just lie and say we did. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> this is being recorded. Trouble. Uh, right, right, right. What was I thinking? <laughs> Can I ask two questions? Sure. Is that okay. Yeah. Uh, w one is, um, I don't know if there's any work being done on making the town or at least the page for the um, people with disabilities, um, the website page accessible to the blind. Um, is that something that the town is Got any, well, uh, I mean, well, I can say unofficially or officially, we hate the town website. The current administration hates the town website, and we are we are now in um, consultation with a number of different vendors to try to come up with a new website because it, it's great if you're in the 50s or 60s, but it's a, we think it's a terrible website. So it's being completely redesigned. Um, I don't know about uh, access for the blind. I assume that will be considered, but uh, I can find out and I will be happy to find out before the next meeting. I'll have an answer for you before the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. And even typeface for, for people who, you know, I mean, like font size and stuff. Right. No, for, I'm with you. I'm it's, with. It's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> um, and, and then this, I mean, you know, this may sound rhetorical, um, but uh, 
and I sort of alluded to this earlier, who came up with the name for the commission? Um, just so that I know to address my um, concerns about it too. I'd love to take that one. This commission came out of a subcommittee of the human services commission and the commission subcommittee came up with the name of it. Okay. Um, when that group right. is disbanded. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for sure. explaining that. And, and so, so that group was disbanded and now, so then there's no, there's not an entity or person, um, and. No, because this is a separate commission, but as the commission goes forward, it's a temporary 3 year commission. And if the group, does, you know, works to be a permanent commission, um. Certainly, they can look at the name of it. Yeah, I, I think my only issue with it is. And again, I know this may seem rhetorical for most people, but um, I think that uh, that having the disabilities uh, small d, big A is is it's condescending. It's insulting. Um, it 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 erases, which is my one of my big has been one of my big complaints about being a twenty five year resident who has been disabled that long um, in this town is just feeling erased constantly, constantly being erased. And when um, the word, uh, when the disabilities, when it says disabilities, it's ableism. It's a concentrating on, um, it, it's, it's just say the word, you know, it, it's dis we're disabled and that's fine. And it's just okay to say that we don't need to concentrate on abilities. Because um, mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, I want to call everybody. Um, I want to, you know, I don't know what say non non disabled, but with a little n and a big D. Um, I don't know how not how non disabled people feel about that, but you might not like it. <laughs> um, so I, I just think it's sugarcoating and um unnecessary and it would be great to just um have it be okay mm. to, to have people with disabilities and just call it that and I, I just you know for 25 years like i say in this town i have i have been to meeting 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 meetings where i'm the only person who's disabled and has stood up in front of the rtm and stood up um, for the tax relief and stood in front of people and had to go over and over and over these issues about just saying the word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's actually a thing on Twitter. I'm not even a Twitter user, but it's called, it's like the Me Too movement, you know, hashtag say the word. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just that simple. Mm -hmm. That's a, a point of rec recognizing. Um, so it's a, it's another we, perspective. So, uh, you know, that's something that the commission can, you know, as, as going forward can certainly take a look at. I, I would really appreciate it because erasure in this town is, I mean, I don't think people intend it, but it, it is really discouraging. Okay. It really is. And, and, I, and since this commission's one of, it seems like one of the goals is for inclusion and acceptance and being part of the community, that seems like that. You know, that's a, that's a big reason why you're, you're all, um. Doing such hard work. Okay. okay. Um, that's all I had though, Ron. Okay. Um, already. So I guess we'll, we'll thank you for your, your time and comments, everyone and input, um, and make a motion to adjourn. Um, it's all you Dan. <laughs> all you Dan. I, I second that motion, or I motion and I second myself. Motion and second. <laughs> Perfect. I think it, okay, very good. Okay, thanks for joining, and um, you guys have, you. A, have a good we'll week. See you soon. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you all. Thanks. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank Bye. you, everyone.